Welcome back to Unveiling the Dark Side. Today we are going over the third layer of the unsolved serial killer and mass murder iceberg. And if you haven't seen the first two, make sure to check them out, then come back. Before we dive in though, don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell to know every time I upload a video. Now let's get right into it. Lane Bryant Shooting The Lane Bryant shooting was an incident of mass murder and armed robbery at a Lane Bryant clothing outlet in the Brookside Marketplace in Tinley Park, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago that occurred on February 2, 2008. The shooting resulted in five people killed and a sixth injured. The identity of the shooter remains unknown. Police released a sketch of the suspect on February 11, 2008, receiving two dozen leads in the first 24 hours. Four customers, a part-time employee and the store manager were taken to the back of the store and shot. Five of them, all women, were killed. The part-time employee was wounded but survived. At least one of the victims was by the perpetrator. Police found the victim shortly after receiving an emergency call at 10.45 a.m. The gunman was described as a black man with thick cornrowed hair and a receding hairline, along with one braid lying over the right side of his face at cheek level, and decorated with four light green beads on the end. Police believe the attack was a robbery gone awry, though the motive of the shooting has been a matter of debate. The five deceased victims were Jennifer L. Bishop, age 34, of South Bend, Indiana, Carrie Hudek Chuso, 33, the store manager, Rhoda McFarland, 42, Sarah T. Zafransky, 22, and Connie R. Woolfolk, 37. The police withheld the age and identity of the surviving victim, the part-time employee of the store, a $100,000 reward, half of which was donated by Lane Bryant's parent company, Charming Shops, Inc., was offered for information leading to the gunman's arrest. Burger Chef Murders The Burger Chef Murders took place at a Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, Indiana, United States, on the night of Friday, November 17, 1978. Four young employees went missing in what was initially thought to be a petty theft of cash from the restaurant's safe. By Saturday morning, it became a clear case of robbery and kidnapping, and by Sunday, when their bodies were discovered, a case of murder. While investigators believe they have identified some or all of the perpetrators, without physical evidence they have not been able to prosecute those who remain alive. Between 11 p.m. and midnight on November 17, 1978, four employees of the Burger Chef restaurant at 5725 Crawfordsville Road disappeared. Assistant Manager Jane Freet, 20, Daniel Davis, 16, Mark Flemons, 16, and Ruth Ellen Shelton, 18. A fellow employee who came by at midnight to visit the four noticed that the restaurant was empty, the safe was open, and the back door ajar when the four did not reappear the following morning, and Freed's Chevrolet Vega was found partially locked in town, concerns grew. It became evident that the youths had been abducted while closing the restaurant for the night, with the attack possibly beginning as they removed trash bags out the back door. On Sunday afternoon, hikers found the bodies of all four youths over 20 miles away, a wooded area of Johnson County. Both Davis and Shelton had been shot numerous times with a 38 caliber firearm. Freed had been stabbed twice in the chest, the handle of the knife had broken off and was missing. The blade was later recovered during an autopsy. Clemens was later determined to have been bludgeoned, possibly with a chain, and died from choking to death on his own blood. All four victims were still wearing their Burger Chef uniforms. Money and watches were found on the dead victims, implying that robbery might not have been the sole motive for the murders. On the night of the murders, a 16-year-old eyewitness saw two suspicious men in a car outside the Burger Chef just before closing. Both men were white and in their 30s. One man had a beard, the other was clean-shaven with light-colored fair hair. The police had models of the suspects created in clay to assist the investigation. In 1984, Detective Mel Wilsey of the Marion County Sheriff's Department received a call from Donald Forrester, an inmate at the Pendleton Correctional Facility. Forrester claimed to have been involved in the murders and was willing to confess in order to avoid his scheduled transfer to a notoriously violent state prison. Wilsey received a court order to bring Forrester to Marion County, where he confessed to shooting Davis and Shelton. He then led police to the crime scene in the woods, where he accurately described the location and position of the bodies when they were found. He also knew about the broken handle of the knife, which was not widely publicized. According to Forrester, Freed's brother James owed money on a drug deal, so he and three other associates had gone to the restaurant to threaten her. But when Flemons intervened to protect Freed, a fight broke out during which Flemons fell, 
and hit his head on the bumper of a car. Believing he was dead or dying, Forrester and his accomplices decided to abduct and kill all the employees to eliminate all the witnesses to their crime. Forrester claimed to have shot Davis and Shelton and gave the names of three men he claimed were responsible for killing Flemons and Freet. He then led the police to a spot where he claimed he had thrown the gun into a river. However, a thorough search of the river did not find any weapon. Wilsey interviewed Forrester's ex-wife, who said that he had driven with her out to a wooded area shortly after the murders and retrieved several shell casings, which he then flushed down the toilet. Wilsey then got a warrant to search the septic tank of the house, which turned up several spent 38 caliber shell casings. However, after someone within the sheriff's office leaked details of Forrester's cooperation, he suddenly recanted his confession and claimed it was coerced. With no further cooperation from Forrester and no direct evidence proving he committed the murders, Forrester was never charged. He died in prison from cancer in 2006 at age 55, despite thousands of hours of police investigation, as well as Burger Chef offering a reward of $25,000 to anyone who could capture the murderers or provide information about their whereabouts. The attackers were never prosecuted, and the case remains officially unsolved. The Indiana State Police continue to keep the case open and have reportedly investigated the use of DNA tracing techniques developed since the initial investigation. West Fertilizer Company Explosion On April 17, 2013, an ammonium nitrate explosion occurred at the West Fertilizer Company storage and distribution facility in West Texas, United States 18 miles north of Waco. While emergency services personnel were responding to a fire at the facility, 15 people were killed, more than 160 were injured, and more than 150 buildings were damaged or destroyed. Investigators confirmed that ammonium nitrate was the material that exploded. On May 11, 2016, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives stated that the fire had been deliberately set. That finding has been disputed. The State Fire Marshal Department said that investigators interviewed almost 300 people and followed 160 leads in their initial investigation. In May 2013, the Texas Department of Public Safety instructed the Texas Rangers and the McLennan Sheriff's Department to join the Texas Fire Marshal's Office and the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives in the criminal investigation into the explosion. Investigators blamed stocks of ammonium nitrate fertilizer stored in a bin inside a seed and fertilizer building on the property for the explosion, but failed to identify what started the actual fire that led to the explosion. At least seven lawsuits were filed against Adair Green Inc., which owned the West Fertilizer Company facility. On October 11, 2015, a day before jury selection was to begin, parties reached a partial settlement in one case. Its terms have not been disclosed. The settlement includes the families of the three civilians killed in the fire and explosion. This is separate from the $118,300 in fines that West Fertilizer was handed for violating several rules about the handling of hazardous materials. A trial for a second group of plaintiffs was expected to begin in late 2016. In January 2018, it was reported that the City of West will receive $10.44 million in settlements with defendants in the litigation around the plant explosion. The West City Council approved the settlement, which includes funds for damages not covered by insurance or grants from state or federal agencies. The lawsuit that the settlement pertains to was filed on behalf of the city and claimed the defendants were negligent in selling or distributing the ammonium nitrate-based fertilizer, that they failed to properly warn of the dangers associated with the handling and storage of the product, and should have never sold the product to West Fertilizer. As of 2019, ATF has a $50,000 reward for information leading to arrests in the case. To date, no one has been criminally charged in the case. Atlanta murders of 1979 to 1981 the Atlanta murders of 1979-1981, sometimes called the Atlanta Child Murders, was a series of murders committed in Atlanta, Georgia, between July 1979 and May 1981. Over the two-year period, at least 28 children, adolescents, and adults were killed. Wayne Williams, an Atlanta native who was 23 years old at the time of the last murder, was arrested, tried, and convicted of two of the adult murders and sentenced to two consecutive life terms. Police subsequently have attributed a number of the child murders to Williams, although he has not been charged in any of those cases, and Williams himself maintains his innocence, notwithstanding the fact that the specific style and manner of the killings, which was by chokehold strangulation, ceased after his arrest. In March 2019, the Atlanta police, under the order of Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, reopened the cases in hopes that new technology will lead to a conviction for the murders that were never resolved. In July, Bottoms announced that DNA had been identified and sampled in two cases that will be subjected to additional analysis by a private lab, Sorensen Forensics of Salt Lake City. Additionally, investigators combed through 40% of the original DNA evidence and sent that to the same private lab for testing on June 21, 2021. As of December 2022, no results have been made public despite requests from the victims' families. Connecticut River Valley Killer 
The Connecticut River Valley Killer, also known as the Valley Killer, is a moniker for an unidentified American serial killer believed to be responsible for at least seven murders of young women in the Connecticut River Valley of the Northeastern United States between 1978 and 1988. The timeline of the murders was as follows. October 24, 1978. Kathy Milligan was the first known victim. Kathy had been at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve photographing birds. She was found the next day a few yards from where she had been last seen in New London, New Hampshire. July 25, 1981. Mary Elizabeth Critchley disappeared while hitchhiking near Interstate 91 at the Massachusetts Avermont border. Her body was found 15 days later on August 9th on Stagecoach Road in Claremont, New Hampshire. May 30, 1984. Bernice Cordemanche, a nurse's aide, vanished from West Claremont, New Hampshire, while she was hitchhiking to her boyfriend's house in Newport. It was assumed that she was traveling along Route 12. Her remains would be found on April 9, 1986, in Kellyville, New Hampshire. They were located about a thousand yards from where Ellen Freed's remains had been discovered in 1985. July 20, 1984, Ellen Fried, also a nurse, vanished in West Claremont, New Hampshire. She stopped after leaving work at the Valley Regional Hospital to make a phone call to her sister. As the two talked, Ellen commented that a strange car seemed to be driving back and forth by the grocery store Leo's Market, where she was using the payphone. Ellen was nervous enough about the other vehicle that she told her sister to stay on the line while she made sure her car started before she hung up with her. The next day, Ellen didn't show up at work and was reported as a missing person. Her car was found later that day abandoned on Jarvis Road. It was only a few miles from the grocery store. Ellen's remains would be found on September 19, 1985. She was located on the banks of the Sugar River in Kellyville. July 10, 1985. Ava Morris was hitchhiking home from work on Route 12 on the border of Claremont and Charlestown, New Hampshire. When she vanished, bloggers found her body on April 25, 1986 in Unity, New Hampshire. Eva's body was only 500 feet from where Mary Elizabeth Critchley's remains had been discovered. May 15, 1986, Linda Moore was at home in Saxton's River, Vermont, doing yard work. She lived only a short distance from the I-19. When her husband returned home from work, he found his wife's body. She had been stabbed multiple times, and the crime scene showed it had been a savage attack. Witnesses came forward describing a stocky, dark-haired man who seemed to be lingering in the neighborhood that day. They recalled he carried a blue backpack and seemed to be between 20 and 25 years old. He was clean-shaven and had dark-rimmed glasses. January 10, 1987, Barbara Agnew, a nurse, was returning home from a skiing trip in Stratton, Vermont. That evening, a road worker found her green BMW abandoned at the northbound I-19 rest stop in Hartford, Vermont, only 10 miles from her home. The driver's door was left open a crack. Inside, there was blood on the steering wheel. Barbara's body would be found found on March 28, 1987, near an apple tree in Hartford. She was still wearing her ski bibs, which held her lift ticket. The snow surrounding her body was still black with blood. They originally had her sister Anna Agnew identify the body with the jewelry Barbara had been wearing. April 6, 1988, Jane Borowski, seven months pregnant, had spent the evening at a county fair in Keene, New Hampshire. On her way home, she stopped to get a drink from a vending machine beside a grocery store in Winchester, New Hampshire. After getting the soda, she returned to her car and just started to drink. When a man appeared next to Jane's window. He asked her about the payphone. Without warning, he then opened Jane's car door and started attacking her. As he physically assaulted her, he yelled that she had hurt his girlfriend. Jane denied this. Then he asked if she had Massachusetts plates on her car. Again, Jane denied this, saying she had New Hampshire plates. She ran as soon as she got a chance, but her attacker caught up to her and stabbed her. 27 times in all, he left her for dead and drove off. She was able to crawl back to her car and drive over two miles on Route 32 to a friend's house for help. Before arriving at her friend's, she realized that the car in front of her was her attacker. When she pulled into her friend's house, her attacker paused for a moment, then did a U-turn and drove past slowly, before finally leaving as her friend started helping her. Jane was able to get medical attention where it was determined she suffered from a severed jugular, two collapsed lungs, a kidney laceration, and severed tendons in her knees and thumb. Fortunately, both Jane and her baby survived. There were three top suspects that were believed could have been responsible for some or all the murders. Michael Nicolau was a former Army helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War. He first rose to the top of the list when his description matched with Jane's composite sketch. In 2005, Michael killed his wife and stepdaughter alongside himself, Gary Westover. In October of 1997, paraplegia Gary Westover told his uncle, a retired sheriff's deputy, Howard Minnan, a disturbing story. He said that in 1987, he and three friends had gone out for a night of partying in Vermont. Westover said that his friend 
Hans had come around and loaded him and his chair into the van. They had been drinking before they abducted and butchered Barbara Agnew, and then left her body in the snow on a back road. Westover told his uncle the names of the other men involved, who then wrote them down. After Minnan talked to his wife and daughter about what his nephew had told him, they then called law enforcement over to their house and explained the story to them. They also gave the officers the names of the other three men, but Minnan said he didn't feel the authorities took him seriously. In March of 1998, Gary Westover died. Delbert Tolman, on May 20th, 1984, Heidi Martin 16 was out jogging in Heartland, Vermont. Her body would be found and stabbed the next day in a swamp behind the Heartland Elementary School. Delbert C. Tallman, 21, confessed and was put on trial, where he recanted and was acquitted. Police looked at him as a suspect when Barbara Agnew's body was found only a mile away from where Heidi's was located. Tallman had previously lived in Bellow Falls, Springfield, and Windsor, Vermont, and in Claremont, New Hampshire, the epicenter of the killings. In 1996, he was convicted of two counts of lewd, lascivious conduct with a child. After being released, he moved to Florida, where he was arrested for failing to register with the registry. To date, no one has been charged in the connection to all the murders. Wow, that was a long one. And since it was so long, we are going to make this layer a two-part video. Now, since I didn't want to do this, I promised to jump right into making the next one. Now, if you enjoyed the video, please make sure to like and subscribe and turn on the bell so you know whenever I do upload the next part. All the support really helps. Thanks, and let me know in the comments what other stuff you would like me to explore next. Thanks for watching. And always remember, stay curious and keep exploring, even in the hidden corners of the happiest places on earth.